Tim and I have been talking a lot back and forth over the last maybe year and a half or two years as we both started up on you know our internet presence. And one of the things that comes up consistently is, is how do you teach lean concepts in a way that isn't either adversarial or that isn't intimidating to people. So we want people to be very receptive to learning about these topics. So, so Tim, why did we pick this topic particularly? Well, I think there's a lot of coffee drinkers out there. So, I mean, what better uh, topic to get around than uh, kind of this water cooler idea? You know, we'll take the uh, coffee uh, pot idea and uh, use that as an example. I think everybody can relate to making coffee, whether it's at home or at work. And uh, so this is a great example to kind of get uh, started with this new idea of trying to learn about lean through everyday examples. And, and, and the challenge that people face is when there's an example that's a specific one that they're used to, they, they might grasp onto it or they might be intimidated or a little bit um, put off by somebody coming in and trying to teach them about what they already think they know. So, so you can get people who almost immediately, just based on the topic of the examples that you choose, will tune out to the message you're trying to deliver. So a very neutral message like this really helps with that. It helps keep people from... Um, becoming defensive about what you're talking about, but it also really helps in that um, people can relate to it, like Tim was saying, is that there's there's no uh, feeling of, oh, this this topic you're talking about, if you talk about something in the, in the lean office, say a, a customer service team, anybody who might be in accounting can immediately tune out when the example doesn't apply to them. But again, so this is a very neutral thing. It doesn't generate that emotional response, and it's something that people can relate to without feeling like it doesn't apply to them. Yeah, I agree. Sometimes you find that people just are too close to the process uh, at hand and can't really see the uh, tools and techniques and thinking that we're doing. Um, and they'll, they'll use the excuse that, uh, well, it won't work here. So we all know how to make coffee, so we'll kind of try to go through some uh, different things uh, related to lean uh, using the coffee. But, and, Tim, you're a coffee drinker, right? Of course. So, so which would you prefer? Well, I mean, I, I kind of prefer the uh, the single cup uh, brewing machine. Uh, you know, I think it has some advantages, uh, uh, and, you know, cons maybe as well, but uh, that's the one I prefer. How about you, Jeff? Well, I like it fresh. And, and when you look at a coffee pot, you know, if you actually track the value stream, like from the beans when they first, you know, come to your house, they may sit in, the, in a bin. You may grind them ahead of time in a big batch, and they may be sitting there. And in the machine on the left, it creates that flow, so the beans are ground and processed, and they go from, from grind to actual steaming cup of coffee in a matter of seconds. You're getting that flow involved into it. So there's never any time where the beans are sitting idle in, in, a, in, in the production process. Right. And, and, and it, it gives that, 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 to me, it gives that flavor. And, and that's one of those big things about what customers want. So, so you know, Tim, talk about the, you know, how you how do you decide what customers want? Sure. I think what's important to notice in the, the two examples here is there is a difference in the uh, uh, speed, the, the, the uh, freshness, the flavor that you get, to the time it takes to brew, and maybe even the cost per cup that you're going to make. There is a difference between those two machines as to what you want. So, what we're really talking about is what's the customer want? What's the customer find value in? And we see this in our workplace uh, and our organizations um, that we all work at is what is that value? We're always trying to come around what is the value for the customer, not what we think the value is uh, or what we can give, but in terms of the customer's eyes, the customer's voice, what do they see? So you kind of get this example here where we're trying to understand well, what is it? And so. I think if you're looking at freshness, you may take a different uh, machine, uh, being the single cup, than you would with the uh, larger batch. But if you're trying to service, you know, a number of people all at once, you might go to the approach of taking the uh, the pot uh, brewing approach. You know, it's interesting that you say it like that because a lot of our processes that we see in organizations are set up based on what the company needs or what's good for the company. So, you know, if you have a big CNC machine, you might run a lot of batches in your production. And if you have really sophisticated databases, you may do a process based on the database's capabilities rather than what your customers need. So you get this disconnect between what the customers really want and, and what your organization is capable of doing. And, and the default position should be what the customers want. But a lot of the processes, when we, when we take a step back and look at them, it's, we're not doing things because the customers asked us to make them 
that way. So the customers never asked us to fill a big pot full of coffee. You know, they tell us what they want, and that's because of the capabilities we have, the inability to plan our demand properly, and all those sorts of things. Those are the reasons why we do things the way we do, not because of what the customers want. So anytime you start in a lean example or lean process, you really want to focus on that customer perspective, the customer's desires, customer's needs, and all that. Right. And a great example that I'm always reminded of is uh, the case where we had this uh, shingle prize-winning toast Kaizen video, and they go through the, the waste of uh, trying to identify how to, you find uh, in the process of making toast, and they come out to find out that the customer wanted a different type of toast than you got, uh, than that person made. So this is the same kind of approach. You know, what is, what is it that uh, we're after when we're brewing this cup of coffee? And, and, and you hit on a good point there is they didn't want that same kind of toast. And that's, the, that's one of the main problems with batching. So if you look at this cup of coffee, you know, there's, you know, five and a half cups of coffee left in this one, but it's a particular type of bean, right? You know, obviously there's right. a problem with that. Yeah, so it's one type of coffee. So if you, you know, in this approach, you can't brew a lot of different varieties uh, quickly. So that's, that's one of the drawbacks to this type of batching process. And I think you find this in other organizations as well. Well, you know, and the other big problem you have is just predicting the demand. So the bigger your batch is, the less likely they are to really match precisely what your demand is. You know, so like in this in this example, if you know, if it's just me drinking the coffee, I pretty much know how many cups I'm going to have. But if this is an office coffee pot, on any given day, you don't know how many people are going to want a cup of coffee in that morning, or if they're going to be around, or if there's a conference going on where people are going to want to grab a cup as they go into the conference room. So you don't know how many cups to build or, to, you know, in, in the cups to brew in this case, but the same principle applies in, in any organization. You have to decide how many phone calls are going to come in today. And, you know, phone calls are obviously a little bit harder to batch, but, you know, you can, you can be thinking about things like order entry. If, if, you, if you have piles of orders that come on a desk and you transfer those orders all at once, or if you do batch processing in a database or on the shop floor. And, uh, Tim, talk about what you do. You know, what your what your role is? Right. So certainly we do uh, you know manufacturing of uh, fiber optic uh, cables and various uh, connectors and things. And we run into this uh, issue where we put on connectors on the product sometimes, uh, where you do have to have some sort of curing time for the glue or epoxy, and uh, so you may have a batch process. But you know if you can get that uh, time down, then you can go to things a single piece. Uh, but I think what's important to know with a batch process is while we're waiting for these 12 cups in this case to brew, uh, a single, you know, or multiple people, customers are waiting for that entire process to go. So uh, compared to the single cup, you can service one at a time. So uh, there are trade-offs to these approaches, and you do have to consider that um, in your business. Absolutely. And, and, and the other issue with batching, though, is, you know, the, the quality problems. So let's say... I'm brewing this, co this coffee and I get a uh, bad batch of beans and I've spent all the time brewing this coffee and the first customer takes a drink out of this 12 cup pot and it tastes bad. W what happens? Yeah, you're going to be forced to toss all those, right? And, but you're also not going to know until the pot's uh, brewed, 12, uh, you know, the full, uh, the full amount. So your, your feedback uh, to find out that you've got a quality issue takes longer and then you're forced to get rid of a larger amount than you might have if you do the single piece uh, flow. Your feedback is quicker and you, you, know, you don't waste as much. Uh. And the other thing to keep in mind with that, obviously this is a relatively small batch too, but you may have large batches in your organization and you, know, you can get into a situation where you might want to sort things instead of uh, doing what you probably should do, which is just get rid of it and not take the risk. If you have, you know, you know, maybe another dozen of these pots all brewed with the same bean and you got all these batches, you might decide that you have to sort through some of these batches in order to find which ones are good and bad so people get coffee or, in, you know, whatever product you make in your business. Um, so the risk is much higher when you do the batch operation for quality. And, of course, there's always, you know, like you mentioned, having several coffee pots. That requires more counter space if you have several coffee pots and it requires more inventory of beans and all the different things that go along with the batching. But, but the thing that, you know, people can look at a, a head of lettuce and think about, you know, the, the lifespan of a head of lettuce on the, in, the, in a store. And everybody knows when you, when you go to the grocery, you know, they don't stock the whole wall full of lettuce because it goes bad pretty quickly. 
Coffee has a little bit longer shelf life, but not much longer. But almost every item that you have in any kind of inventory is going to have a shelf life. And whether it's a phone call uh, of you know somebody waiting on the phone, they're going to they're going to abandon that call after a few seconds possibly. Or if you're a home builder and you've just built a bunch of inventory of new homes and you can't sell them in time, and the next year's models come out and so, you know the, the houses start to be aged. And it's, it's hard to sell things that are old and outdated. And it could be computer hard drives or any sort of thing. If stuff sits on the shelves for a long time, the value goes down. There's very few things that raise value the longer it sits. Yeah, I agree. So with these problems with batching, there probably are other uh, scenarios that we might see with coffee as well. 